So, so this is uh, Liz Vivas from Ohio State University, and she's going to talk about party spaces for a class of domains in CN. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm uh, glad to be here at home giving you a talk about some recent work uh, about hardy spaces, which is actually some something that I have I wasn't very familiar with until I started this project. So I'm I hope I'll pass on to you the motivations and the the reason uh, why I got interested on this. All right. So um, Oh, I should say before I actually start that this is joint work with uh, Purvi Gupta in, uh, and Katrin Gallagher and Loretta Melanzani. Okay, so what we were interested in was to find some specific uh, reproducing kernel uh, formulas for the Hartos triangle. So the Hartos triangle is a classic um, object in several complex variables. And so let me actually just remind you in case this is something not very familiar to you of what the Hartos triangle is. Well, it's just basically, um, as you can see geometrically here, I just drew in C2 uh, the mod of Z and mod of W. What this basically is, is just simply, let's see. So this is mod of Z, less than mod of W, less than one. And why is it a classical object? Uh, one reason that it is a classical object is because um, it's as example of a pseudo which is a natural space in which we study different properties in, of holomorphic functions in several variables. But also it's one of those spaces that have a very bad singularity in the boundary. So it's not as smooth at the origin. So here it looks kind of nice, Lipschitz even, but it's not really, because if you think about this, you have to rotate this on this direction and on this direction to really have an idea of how does it look in C2. And if you do that, you notice that um, at this point, it's not even a graph. Okay? So at the origin, let me just write that down. And that uh, by itself makes the study of the uh, many properties of the Hartle triangles difficult or different than they will be on um, other pseudo convex domains that have a smooth boundary. Now, uh, what was, as I said, the motivation we're looking here, we were looking at different function spaces here. And one thing that recently the heart of triangle has come to, um, to light on there's different uh, work, very recent temporary is about the Berman projection of the heart. Of the, in the heart of triangle. So what is the Berman projection? Just think about all the L2 functions on H and you project it basically to um, this piece, which is holomorphic functions on H uh, that are L2. And um, when we talk about strictly zero convex domains with C smooth boundary, with C infinity boundary, these are the kind of domains that uh, have the most regularity properties. So being a domain of this type gives you some regularity properties with respect to this type of projection. This is called the Berman projection. Um, but when it's not uh, a smooth bounded domain, things are not so simple. And recently, uh, Chakravarti and Seitunku proved that for the hardest triangle, LP regularity is not a given for every P. So it is in the C infinity smooth boundary case for strongly zero convex domains, 
and then you can relax those things, but for the heart to triangle itself, even though it's zero convex and nice, it's not. So uh, P irregularity, let's say. Or maybe regularity for some P's for a, a certain interval of P. But um, as opposed to LP regularity for the nice cases for P between one and infinity. And, and these kind of properties about the LP regularity or LTL to regularity actually are a tool that allows us in several complex variables to do different things. Um, but the LP regularity, it's, it's a new phenomenon. All right, um, I will not continue talking about these Berman projection uh, things because when it comes to the Berman projection, there's like a lot of different works by different people. Um, I will not exhaust the uh, works and the names, uh, but just say that it has become a quite an active um, area of research to study, not only oh, heart triangles, me. but also heart of generalized heart of triangles. Was there a question? Yeah. So can, can you explain a few words, like what do you mean by LP regularity here? Yeah, so I mean that the, the Berman, so I can restrict my Berman projection to like LP instead of L2. And here it will be unbounded, an unbounded operator or not. That's what I meant. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So how are these spaces, or well, the idea here will, for Hardy spaces, what is the idea for Hardy spaces in one variable is that you have somehow the boundary condition of a, of a function or the boundary behavior of a holomorphic function and can recover on the inside. Um, so let me actually just remind you a little bit of what how are holomorphic Hardy spaces define C. Also, I should say, I should include this word holomorphic Hardy spaces because uh, this is something that, that people do use um, sometimes in other contexts, harmonic Hardy spaces, etc. So let's talk about C. All right, so in C, holomorphic Hardy spaces have been extensively studied in the following cases um, on the disk. This is actually the classical holomorphic Hardy space um, theory, basically. The upper half plane, of course, just being by holomorphic to the disk. But once you have it onto this, we have Riemann mapping theorem. So people also study uh, holomorphic Hardy spaces on simple connected domains. And now, once you study them on simple connected domains, you take that idea of how do you do it in each one connected domains, and you can do it on multiple connected domains too. By here, I mean, yeah. So some somehow the, the study of hard spaces have been extended to this, and uh, there is different applications. I uh, will not go over them now, but I will just mention Dirichlet problem for the bar solutions. Again, regularity of certain integral operators, uh, characterization of life transforms, etc. Okay, so there is a well-known theory here. And what about in CN? In CN, it has, it has been done more in a case-by-case -case basis. And the reason is um, because we don't really have a Riemann mapping theorem to have a general, for instance, setup for simply connected domains. And, um, and also, I will explain in a bit, but there's not really a canonical definition of a Hardy space. But what, what type of cases have been studied? Of course, if you generalize the, the disk to poly disks in, in CN, it has a, a standard Hardy space and also say the ball, okay. there's zero radius one CN. And others actually, um, I should mention maybe some well, there are cases that this has been studied on, say, uh, tube domains. 
and hyperconvex domains. Wait, by hyperconvex domains, say I just mean that there is an exhausting, exhaustive uh, cross harmonic function that defines my domain. All right, so still the problem is, or as I was saying, the, the main um, reason why uh, we have, don't have a theory since for the heart of uh, triangle is because there is no canonical definition. Okay, so I will explain what do I mean by this. What is the canonical definition in, in C, but not in other spaces? All right. So uh, I will say that the aim of my talk today is to construct hardy spaces for certain classes of domains that will cover the heart of triangle. That was basically our, our motivation. So let's study now how the hardy spaces have been constructed in one complex dimension. So let's start with the disk. Okay, so here I have started writing some things. Um, this might be very, very familiar to you or not, but let me just remind you a couple of facts of or different ways that people construct hardy spaces in the disk in C. So the classical way is that you start with functions that are holomorphic on D. So this is my notation, okay? O of D just means holomorphic on D. And, but not all of them will be inside my Hardy space, only the ones whose average value on certain uh, circles around the origin, on every circle going towards the boundary around the origin. Um, I want that this, basically radius is the average is around this little disk to be defined. So that's what one of the classical ways of defining this. This is like every holomorphic functions such that is supreme. Uh, I don't know why I'm grading here one over two pi, but okay, so I guess we do define then the, the size for a function like this, but Oops, sorry. Sorry. Okay, so that's uh, that's one way to define it. That's one way to define our or L2 hardy space. But there is another uh, boundary based definition. This, in this setting, the hardy space are functions that are holomorphic in D. Whereas this other way, it's another classical way to do it in which you're gonna have that the functions are actually boundary values. So what we do here is you take the closure of AD, what is AD? AD is going to be simply holomorphic functions in D, continues up to the boundary. And um, I basically restrict these functions to the boundary of D and take the L2 completion because these are not L2 complete on, on the boundary of D with respect to which L2 measure with respect to just to the length measure there. So this is another way to see it. And again, now this will be seen as more as a boundary uh, based definition. And this one is actually more of a exhaustive exhaustion procedure. But indeed there is no difference. These two things are exactly the same. You can, um, characterize one with the other by just using your uh, uh, power series. One is going to live in, in the boundary and you see, you check that it's gonna have only up e to the i and theta for n positive, and then you just associate it to the same uh, e to the z to the n in H2. And this way of, of uh, thinking of, of the L2 Hardy space, well, people just really don't distinguish between these two because they are the same. But what allows us is also to have uh, reproducing 
kernel Hebert space for functions in AD. So as a consequence, we're gonna have that for F that belongs to AD. We're gonna have the, in the um, following formula. You can deduce the value inside your domain by just knowing the values outside. And this is many times what it's called the Zeko kernel. Okay, so actually, let me just write down the tiny proof of this. This might be like the only proof that I write today. Um, so we know that if F is continuous up to the boundary by Cauchy, it means that you can write F of C or Z inside D as uh, this integral F of W divided by W minus C DW. And uh, if I want to restrict this to a measure on the boundary, uh, as the arc length measure in the boundary, I can uh, use my D, my W bar multiply inside. W bar has mod equal to one. And this is exactly equal to the integral of on the boundary of D of this. Uh, actually, let me write that all together to one side. F of W multiplied by one over to pi i one minus c times w bar. And now here I will have my arc line measure for z and d. So this part over here is what's known many times as the Zego kernel of d. And as you can see, it depends on two variables, Z and W, it's holomorphic on Z and the holomorphic on W. And it's giving me boundary, uh, given boundary values I can obtain in uh, the function, or complete behavior of my function inside of OC. Okay, so. Um, so, so before you move on, this might, must, it might be something I missed, but um, like if you would take, um, Yes, analytic functions on the disk uh, with finite L2 norm where you integrate over the whole disk. Um, what would, would that sort of, would you get something completely different or is it similar to this? I think you will get something similar to this because the, in the radial direction, you will just um, have something finite and the boundary values, see if, this, if they're all holomorphic, the boundary values are the largest values. So they should be dominated by this L2 norm somehow. Right, okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, so um, this is all in D. And I mentioned before that a lot of this study can be translated to a simple connected domain, but you cannot really translate it to things like puncture domains. And if we if we think about the Hartos triangle, the Hartos triangle is really by holomorphic to D cross D star. So it's the D star part that it's giving us trouble. And so to really understand what's gonna happen on the Hartos domain, um, we really need to understand what, what is the problem in D star or what part of this study doesn't extend to D star. Why, uh, which one of these things are not canonical there or like they're, they're not uh, well behaved or which one to choose from. Uh, it's probably gonna be a different thing if I choose the first one, etc. So let me tell you a little bit about what happens on, in this star. This star, um, I, by that I just simply mean the puncture disk, the disk minus the origin. And I'm gonna um, start with certain definition of, well, I think I'm gonna try to call my H to the star, which is gonna be again boundary values. Now the boundary is going to be the boundary of the disk union the origin. Um, but since the origin is just a point, it would make sense uh, to just think about my function as functions in the, in the boundary of D. So here A, I'm being vague because I'm not telling you what A is, but it's going to be, well, what are my choices for A? Um, A could be as I chose it up there, I, I chose holomorphic functions on this star. Um, intersection continues up to the boundary of this term. And okay, whatever choices I have, I will, I, will, I will show you here a couple of choices that we have. 
I'm gonna have to, a similar scheme though, in which I restricted the boundary of this star and I completed with respect to L2 of the boundary of, um, of this star. Well, as I just said, the boundary of this star is two parts. It, with the one point, um, there's no, you can disregard that for L2 measure. And there is my arc length measure of the, of the circle. All right, but if we are here, if we do this, well, these are basically functions that are continuous up to inside the disk. And uh, therefore, these are just the same thing that we had before. This is just A of D. Uh, yeah. Yes, any questions? So I was just wondering that the earlier choice that you made is the same as AD, but then you mentioned it, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It is exactly the same as AD, right? So this is not a good choice, no, not nothing new, basically. Um, another choice that we could have is, say, instead of doing, um, okay, so I definitely want to have holomorphic on this star, but now I'm not going to ask for continuity up to the origin, just continuity to the, to the, to the boundary of D. And what a, a problem that arises here that I'm, I'm not showing you at the moment, but I'm kind of gonna explain in a second why it doesn't work, is that this space will have as a problem that point evaluations will not be bounded. So let me just write that down here. And what is happening really that every function that has an essential singularity at the origin belongs to A. That sorry, that it's uh, uh, continuously up to the boundary. Um, it's going to belong to A. And, and basically those functions are gonna give me um, trouble for, uh, trying to find reproducing kernel, um, reproducing kernel formulas. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to go back to this in a second to explain why this is not good, why point evaluations are not bounded is bad for my case, but now I'll, I'll let you know which one is the choice that we do choose here. So do you mean not bounded in L with respect to L2? Yes, I mean, with respect to, uh, so yes, uh, if you start thinking about like the, Point of, because what I want to do is have a reproducing curve of similar space, right? So I right. want to have something that it's bounded in one direction. So at each point of the disk you pick, point evaluation at that um, value may not be an L2 bounded functional. That's what you... Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's not going to be bounded by a constant uh, independent. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the... The third choice and the choice that we choose really here is, well, essential singularities are not good, but the things that do we do allow are going to be poles. And, but of course, poles have an order. So we're gonna uh, choose different poles up to different order case. And that's going to give me different, different um, hard spaces. Okay, so the choice that we choose here is going to be a is going to be equal to what is going to be, well, first I, I better give some indexes. A will be this uh, one of the following. And what am I gonna choose here? Well, it's going to be basically functions that are holomorphic in the functional disk. But when you multiply by z to the k, f, they are actually on the original ad. So continuous up to the boundary of both sides, um, continuous up to zero, that will give you the holomorphicity. So these are, again, we can think about this as just simply all holomorphic functions with poles up to order k. And now I can construct my definition. My new definition of a hard space of 
order k will be something like this h k to b star will be constructed as the completion of this a k d star respect to the l2 d And even though it looks a little clunky because you're choosing different k's, this actually has a natural hierarchy. Uh, and of course, we will have that h0 is nothing but that classical ad, and that's actually going to be for the for the puncture disk is going to be included. This is going to be um, the inclusion is strict and we have that um, that in each one of these because of what i mentioned that the in this case point evaluation will be bounded you will obtain um, a, a, a kernel you can obtain actually formulas for each one of these um, spaces and so we do have reproducing kernel what we could call seco kernels of each one of these spaces. So you will have to, if you have some uh, function in each of these spaces, you can integrate with respect to this. Uh, oops. And this is a nice exercise. To just check that it works for each one of these cases. Uh, Z will be in my puncture disk, of course, and W will be in the boundary. Okay, so we do obtain some uh, reproducing several kernels here. Uh, and of course, if you are in, for instance, H1, you have all the several kernels of H1, but also of H2, H3, etc. And um, and that's basically an indication of something that we notice. Okay, so you had a nice hard space on D and you get some filtration of some type of hard spaces on the puncture disk. So with our idea was, well, we can really extend these. There's no reason why D and the puncture disk are special at all. If you have some hard spaces on a parental domain type of thing, there's going to be some um, inheritance scheme in which if you take away uh, some, in this case, you take away a point because you're in C, but if you're in CN, you can take away basically a full uh, co-dimension one hypersurface uh, type of thing, even like a, a union of those things and, and get a new space, which will be, which will have a hard space um, uh, as filtration of hard spaces. And so that is um, our work. And um, I will explain to you how we cannot really see the heart of triangle as one of these spaces. It will not be, but it will be uh, biholomorphic to one of them. And I can use the biholomorphisms and not always, not precisely, um, uh, hard spaces are not as Berman spaces are, uh, they are not, they don't translate nicely by, by homomorphism almost always, but in many cases uh, they do. We are gonna have a, uh, a way to translate it back to our, to our uh, heart of triangle. But again, uh, that was our motivation to just study D cross D star. It ended up being that there were many other examples that, sound, that were interesting that fitted on this category. So I hope, I'm not going too slow, but this next slide is all written up already. So um, let me just tell you what was our, um, how were our, our construction, how our construction goes. All right, so this is at the inheritance scheme. This is gonna work for any CN, for any N bigger cotton one. And this is what I'm gonna call the, uh, the parent space slide. Okay, 
So we have any CN domain, what am, what am I gonna be, what am I gonna require of my domain? I'm gonna require, um, first of all, let's look at which objects we will, uh, we will think about. Well, so measure in the boundary, supported on the boundary of my domain. Uh, oops. Sorry, in the boundary of my domain and um, Omega T, which I just scrolled over here, is just going to mean Omega union T. Okay. So why, um, do, sometimes we do care about just some parts of the boundary, say you're in, uh, in the poly disk, this cross disk, then it turns out that actually the boundary values that you're interested are actually not in the full boundary of the uh, um, on the full boundary of D cross D, but only in the boundary of this cross boundary of this, which is specific part of your boundary. So that's what I did not want to include the whole boundary. Yes, depending on which case by case we go, this, the support of my measure will be just yes, some part of the boundary. And these are the classic, the, the spaces that we introduce. A omega V will be just simply the holomorphic functions in omega which are continuous up to the boundary in union T. And this is how we define our Hardy space uh, of omega with respect to this measure as the completion again, think about this restricted at the boundary of the, or even at T respect to L2 of, of, of mu, of my final number of measure. Okay, so I do call this a parent space if, so I should, Highlight this part too. Let me highlight it with this different color. We call this apparent space if what? Well, first of all, uh, it's something like point evaluation should be bounded, but well, basically the extension of that will be that for any compact in my omega, I want that the uniform norm f of k should be bounded by ck, then L2 norm of f uh, outside. And also we don't want things to, um, this second condition is a little bit technical. We don't want things to go to um, zero and not be zero in principle or accumulate weirdly on, on the boundary at some points. So this is the second condition. If you have that Fn, a sequence that is Cauchy, L2 new Cauchy, sorry, this is kind of hard to read. She say here, L2 new Cauchy. And uh, uniformly and compact, it's going to zero inside omega. Then we want that this L2 norm should be going to zero. If these things are, are satisfied, and these are satisfied for all the examples that I show you above for the disk, um, the different ways that we, we grow it, then um, we we say H2 omega nu is going to be a hardy space of, of omega comma nu. Perhaps, perhaps a quick question. So in case of your punctured disk, what, what was the T in that case? It, the T was still my, my boundary, my boundary of the whole disk. This okay, but perhaps not the point. Not the point uh, anymore. Yes, okay. yes. I did. And I did ignore the D. I, I did ignore uh, my. So my punch for this actually is not in this category of parent space. My punch for this will be on the category of. I'm gonna do the now. I'm gonna take away something of the parent space, and ah. that's going to be. The, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes. Um, and I should say these conditions are uh, are right now for A omega nu. So I said here for any K, I want F all of these for which F, F that belong to A. So this is the this. And same thing here, um, but we're going to have other families maybe that have these uh, good conditions. 
in which I can apply a similar at the end. So to not repeat later on, let me just write it over here, a function space F on omega t uh, with f restricted to t you know, to be is strongly admissible and I mean it's just a word that we decided to use for just basically again summarizing these two conditions if a and b hold. Okay, so in this case, basically I'm saying, I'm gonna have a hardy space as long as A to A omega mu is a, it's a strongly admissible space. And um, when uh, this, for some cases that omega has been studied, like say C to smooth domains in CN, new being the Euclidean surface area measure, uh, this coincides with the classical hardy space, what, what people do with the classical hardy space, which classical hardy space, I mean functions that are holomorphic inside, continuous up to the boundary, and you just take the boundary values of these kind of things and complete. All right, uh, other examples in which this also coincides is with, uh, uh, if you do polydisks, it's uh, cross itself and times, you're in, and I uh, think about the measure now, the final product measure that I will have the one I mentioned, like the one on the boundaries, the product of the boundaries, then you will also have that. All right, so that was the parent space. And now if you have a parent space, which you we did with the disk and we will have with the disk cross to disk, what do we do? Uh, what is our, our, our scheme? We uh, take something that we called variety, the little domain, or hypersurface the little domain. So actually let me just for color. Right, so this is going to be the inherited hardy space for this um, hypersurface let's call it. Delete it to me. Oops. Okay. So you, you had the omega up there. And what we do is we take V, and V it's going to be just an irreducible. Um, define analytic, minimally define analytic hypersurface on omega closure. So I, just, I, wanna want, I want uh, a defining function here so that V is basically my defining function equal to zero. And um, okay, so who is V? Let's call it. Uh, Okay. And say we have a defining function called, um, okay, so not always we can find this, but suppose we can find a global uh, defining function, minimally defined, let's say here. Uh, so that V is basically phi equal to zero. Okay. Or phi is just in holomorphic of omega union continuous up to the boundary, let's say. So we're going to um, take away this hypersurface and obtain a new domain. Okay, so maybe I should do a little drawing here. This is omega. You might take away some V and whatever you are left with, it's going to be my omega star. 
And the, the theorem that we have is that for each one of these omega stars, I can construct Hardy spaces as long as my original omega had a, a good Hardy space as above. Um, actually, I should have given you a couple more conditions because of course it matters what happens with the, I don't want my um, measure over here, my new measure over here uh, to uh, be concentrated say on the support, sorry, to be concentrated on the V intersection boundary of omega. Um, so, okay, so maybe I should add here. So, okay, I'll add it in a second. Um, okay, so such that we get if omega intersection B, okay, not so good. I'm gonna have space here. Uh, so here, such that omega intersection B not empty. Okay, and I also want that uh, the support, the measure uh, on this intersection should be, should vanish. So remember that my, my support of my measure is somewhere in the boundary and we don't want again to have um, any measure, any concentrated measure there. Okay, so the theorem says that basically for each K, I'm gonna have the same definition that I show you above. Basically, remember it was with Z to the K to times F. Now, instead of Z to the K, my um, functions that I just multiply by is five, okay? You can change, of course, your defining uh, function and you should obtain the same, the same space. And this is uh, strongly admissible. So remember that meant simply that both A and B conditions are satisfied. And that gave me some way of defining our hardy space basically for this um, so HK to omega star mu. Uh, which is just basically gonna be a k of omega star nu restricted to the boundary, well, actually to the L support of nu. This is going to be a, this are reproducing kernel of space. So I do have also some uh, formulas here to, that I can use. And this is basically what we call the Hardy space of level K of uh, Omega star. Okay, so um, the, the example that we saw above was when Omega was the disk, V of Z was just equal to zero, V of Z was just equal to Z, which of course gave me like the, the origin as the only, um, hypersurface type of thing. But of course we can generalize these for different other examples. Uh, in that case, we saw an strict inclusion. And um, as I said above, there was a reason why I didn't choose a specific A and that was because that space A is not strongly admissible. Um, if you think about the, this, this uh, second condition. And um, and this can actually be generalized to, well, you can actually have a union of different hypersurfaces. You just do each one at the same uh, step by steps. So generalizes to omega star minus a union of. But of course, every time you do this, then you have a multi index now because depending on what. Um, when you do it, uh, you get a hardy space for each, for multi-indexes now. All right, so let me actually show you, oops, I'm almost out of time. 
So let me show you some examples of, of, of what kind of things we can cover and how do we go back to the heart triangle. Um, so first of all, for us, for this problem above, I show you some formulas in which you get the filtration, like it never stops. But in fact, we did find some uh, cases in which the filtration does stop. So um, this is what's happening in general. The filtration goes in this direction. H0, of course, is just the original hard space of your, um, of your original domain. But then H1, H2, all of these are like the spaces that are um, containing themselves. And um, if it happens that V intersection is uh, the support of your measure is empty, the inclusion will be always strict. That's uh, kind of what happened on the, on the problem that I show you above. But if you have that the V intersection, the support of your measure is not empty, the above filtration might stabilize. So uh, I just want to show you a little example here. These are what's sometimes called egg domains uh, for any P or equal to one, you can uh, draw this and uh, in these domains, we can study different things. So I'm going to take away uh, some one of the complex lines that are equal to zero, say. Okay, so maybe uh, I'm not going to try to draw it here, but depending on what measure do I choose, so there, I'm going to choose two different um, uh, measures here. If first I could choose just the Euclidean surface measure on the boundary of this. And then you're gonna get that each HK uh, star just stabilizes immediately and they are all equal to actually the H2 mega PD. So there's no difference, they all stay the same, but if we would have chosen instead uh, the Mongean per uh, measure of the boundary related, associated to this uh, specific uh, exhaustion function, say we Mongean per measure. So yes. Think about this as being your exhaustion function, then we do get actually something different with respect to this measure. I'm gonna get something that does not stabilize. Actually, I am lying, it stabilizes after a certain value p minus one after after p minus one. And after that, everything is the same for OK, for OK, we are happy. OK, so we um, we also have reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. I didn't I didn't write down the uh, the formulas up here. I did write down the formulas from D to the star in a similar way you can get formulas. If you have, uh, let me just write that down maybe as a theorem, the last thing that we talk about. And the theorem three is that if, say, C is the omega was your Sego kernel for uh, D for omega, then we obtain actually a Sego kernel for the K, K level. Let's call it like this. And this is going to be, um, sorry. So it's going to be phi of w to the k divided by phi of c to the k multiplied by my initial single kernel over here. Um, yeah, let me just uh, end here. So this is going to be the single kernel for omega minus v. All right, and maybe just the last remark was that the heart of triangle is not of the type uh, omega minus b. 
but d cross d star is, and then I can use a specific uh, holomorphic function that takes me one from a specific by holomorphic function that takes one to the other. Uh, and you just use the classical map between each other that takes one by holomorphically to the other. Now, as I did mention, by holomorphism is not something that really uh, makes Hardy spaces uh, canonically defined, but still we can use this, this one specific hard uh, map to, to work. All right, sorry I went over time. Thank you very much. You did not at all. It's, uh, actually, our time limits are quite lax. Oh, wow. <laughs> all right. If, if there's a you know, couple more thoughts that you wanted to add in, um, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sure, yeah. Maybe I will mention that um, the Hartos triangle is one of the different type of spaces that have been studied. Uh, there is a generalization that has become really kind of um, studied more recently because it has the same properties. It's also zero convex, but it's also the boundary is very badly behaved. And this is what it's called generalized Hartos triangles. And our, our uh, inheritance scheme works for these two. Um, formulas become really like uh, messy. And then of course, like the nice formulas on the, on the disk become very, very complicated. You start having like gamma functions and uh, weird things like that, but, but they are uh, concrete. And so we do our, our goal of like finding very concrete formulas for functions that are defined on the boundary that how do you uh, go inside uh, was still something that uh, it, it works. So that's, that was probably something that we, our motivation um, and now, um, we do think that this can be and in settings, um, but yeah, we haven't yet talk, thought about that very much. Yeah, symmetric space, other symmetric spaces probably, um, things like that. Yeah. Well, definitely, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the nice summary uh, of, of these results and also, I. Uh, I hope I definitely appreciated the quick introduction to hard these spaces. I'm sure the students uh, appreciated it too. Yeah, I My apologies if my daughter is contributing from the background. She, <laughs> she she probably has opinions on hard these spaces too. <laughs> uh, she she came running in and noticed your uh, notes. I'm not sure she had an opinion on uh, uh, hard disk spaces, but she definitely appreciated the colors, the colors. <laughs> yeah, I actually was not very familiar either with uh, hard disk spaces before. I, I, I'm more familiar with Berman spaces. And, um, but yeah, now after having worked through these cases, I realized why, why, um, why there's not really a canonical literature for this because it's very much case by case and really different people introduce their own different hard spaces uh, type of thing. So there's different definitions floating out there. And um, yeah, so this, this way, for instance, with the measure on the boundary associated to the, uh, this is Poletsky. Poletsky's way of seeing most of these hard spaces. So he, um, uses this for not only for this case, but for like any hyper convex domains type of um, situations. I do have a couple of quick questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, first one is more uh, sort of an expanding nature. So in, in your last main theorem, I didn't really have enough time to understand uh, all the quantities here in this equation. So what's this QK on the left? Can you remind me what this QK is? Yes, so as I was saying, like for the disk, uh, 
there is some reproducing formulas, right? So you have the disease inside the disc and uh, omega is going to be on the boundary of the disc and you have some kind of reproducing formula integral of f of omega. So here is going to be some kind of Sego kernel. This is what it's called Sego kernel in general. Whenever you have some type of formula of this type, um, I shouldn't say the disk anymore, now omega. So that's what happens in omega. For which f does this work? Well, for every f in the Hardy space. So this will be, if we have this for omega, then there should be some type of formula for omega v minus v. And that's precisely what uh, my QK meant that for uh, those ones, I'm gonna have my integral. Now it's not C omega anymore, but this way. And that's uh, what I was trying to describe here. Of course, it's minus V or something like that, but yeah, uh, for F. I might, I might have a, um, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no uh, worries. Yeah. But I mean like for F on, the, on that family, specific family, et cetera. Um, I might have a question about this as well. Uh, you said, so if you under biholomorphism, um, does the, the actual formula for the kernel transforming any, any sort of reasonable way or? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, you can see, I guess here on this specific part why the biholomorphisms are not sometimes good because you really need some, uh, to transform in a nice way, you really need some bihormorphism up to the boundary. And if you have it that it goes all the way up to the boundary, then yes, you can probably translate this f of z to some, um, you know, kind of chain rule situation inside it. Um, when it's not, if, like on this case, zw comma w, then it's um, the, the transformation is not as nice. And so you have to introduce a couple more, but um, yeah, I can write down what Sego kernel that will think for H is. It, it ends up being actually pretty messy. Oh, but you got something explicit. Uh, we did get something explicit, yeah. Yeah, we did get something explicit. Um, sorry, there's, there's four coordinates here, right? Because there's uh, Z and W in H, I mean, here is like a Z and W both in one dimension, but here I have Z W and Z prime W prime, and we did we did get something explicit Z Z prime um, times one minus W prime conjugation. Yeah, so that's that's the circle kernel we obtain on on H, um, and it's not symmetric. It shouldn't be because the Hard to strangle is not, but yeah, like this was for this this one. But it it as soon as we move on to to m and n, then like all these nice constants become very complicated, and we do get weird values. But we do get things that are explicit. Um, yeah. Perhaps another quick one. This one's definitely very open-ended. So, uh, uh, re regarding your your spaces of, uh, uh, so, so maybe even two questions. So, I, I wasn't fully able to read between the lines enough here to understand. So, so the the st stabilization of this filtration is this good or bad? Like, how, how is this uh, perceived? Is this a, which which one is more desirable? <laughs> Um, I guess, uh, uh, I guess it does say something about some kind of, something about the functional space that it stabilizes at some point or not, right? Like, uh, I don't know if to say more desirable or, or not, but I think that when, when you have um, inclusions like these, which don't, and that means that there is more and more space to have strange functions maybe that that have uh, a behavior that doesn't really correspond to like the the, the original space without without the hypersurface deleted. Um, 
I don't know if I will say one is more desirable than the other, but I think stabilization is a good thing because that gives you like a stopping point on where from which you can really start working like okay this might be my or my the best hard space i can obtain right like it I stabilizes see. up to some point but it still not has it hasn't been like the original one which didn't give me anything new mm -hmm. uh, yeah but maybe like things like the disc the puncture disc right it never stabilizes there and i think that tells you something right that there can be holomorphic functions to have infinitely many poles in some ways but yeah and then uh, a connected question. This is the open-ended one. So, so having uh, so to a, a hypersurface, one can associate a, a line bundle, and uh, vanishing up to a specific order on a uh, uh, along a, a hypersurface can be interpreted as uh, as being a section of a specific line bundle. So uh, uh, I, I just wonder if, you know, so, so along these lines, these inclusions can be also sort of thought as, you know, uh, like uh, uh, if you look at higher and higher powers of certain type of line bundles, does the number of sections you have somehow, or uh, so, sorry, the kind of sections you have, does it stabilize? Uh, I wonder if that type of point of view is something that, uh, you know, you, you, you looked at. We thought about it. Um, we did think about that, but uh, the condition in which um, we weren't sure how to proceed if we thought about it in that way was, what does it mean for something in, like, say a line bundle to be on L2 of new, uh, so, I guess we had to be like a little more, when we came to the l 2 we had to make some choices and so things weren't as canonical anymore. I, I don't know. think that that means that there's no way to see it on that, uh, on that point of view that will be more clear. It's just yeah. that we, at the time we did it, we didn't really, couldn't see it directly, so. Yeah. I mean, it could be that it's not that very fruitful to, to, to transition to that. Uh, it could also be that it's not, right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. What note-taking app are you using, by the way? I, I, I love this. Uh... <laughs> Good notes. Good notes? Good notes? Yeah. I'm looking.